Okay. Hey everyone, this is my first video note thing. So hopefully this goes well. Um, yeah, the reasoning behind these things is just, I think it's helpful for people to be able to access this type of um, like review session even when they're at home. Uh, so hopefully this will be helpful for the midterm. So basically this is gonna encompass most of the chemistry for biology stuff that we've done, just like a general review of some key concepts that we've talked about. Um, yeah, so hopefully this is helpful. I think the first thing that I want to touch on is that electronegativity um, sort of number line that we saw. So this was something that we saw kind of on the first day of classes, but we saw this like number line where it's kind of divided up into these sections and we kind of categorized um, like the types of bonds that we would see in um, an atom or in a molecule or between atoms based on the electronegativity differences between the two atoms. So we said that if we saw anything that had an electronegativity difference between the two atoms, um, that was between 0 and 0 0.4, we categorized this as a nonpolar covalent bond. So a great example of this would be like a carbon-hydrogen bond. The difference in their electronegativities is something like 0 0.3. So it's right in between, um, like it's right within this region. And so we can categorize this as nonpolar, which basically means that the electrons, we could consider them pretty equally shared between the two atoms within that bond. Um, so it's definitely not something like an oxygen to hydrogen bond, which is a polar covalent bond because the difference in electronegativity between the two is larger than that of between carbon and hydrogen. So like I just said, oops, like I just said, an example of this would be oxygen bonded to hydrogen because the electronegativity difference between the two atoms is between 0 0.4 and 2. So we would consider this bond a polar covalent bond. And I just want to pause here to touch on this word polar. Um, I think the way that I really understood it was that if you think of something that's polar, it means it has poles. So there are two ends that have like a some sort of difference between them. And in this case, we would say that this molecule is polar because the two ends have a different electro like electron density. So the electrons prefer to be closer to the oxygen because it has a much greater, or not much greater, it has a greater electronegativity than the hydrogen. Um, and that difference is bigger than 0 0.4. So we would say that we don't really consider that equal sharing anymore. It's gone into this like territory of more unequal sharing. And so that allows us to say that an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen or any other, like any other two atoms that have a polar covalent bond between them, we can really categorize these as being a permanent dipole. And that's really all that's saying is just the fact that there is this inequality in their electron density within the bond means that the dipole that's present there, right? We said that it's polar because it, and it has two poles, so dipole. That dipole is always there because the difference in their electronegativity is something that's innate in those atoms. So it's always going to be a property of them unless something funky happens. But really that dipole exists there um, innately in them. So we would consider this a permanent dipole. Other examples would be like a carbon bonded to an oxygen, or you might see it as like carbon double bond oxygen, um, or like a carbon bonded to a nitrogen any sort of thing like that. Those are like pretty common ones that you'll see. And then what's left over is anything that has a electro negativity difference between two and 3.3, we would call this stealing, as in it really is past um, the point of being unequal sharing. And now it's just, we would, yeah, we call it stealing. So. <laughs> This is really the idea that this is considered ionic bonding um, because 
you've just gotten past the point of the difference in electronegativities just being quite like different between the two atoms and so really there's nothing equal about the sharing of the electrons between them. Right, so I think the next thing uh, I'm going to touch on is the idea of how an induced dipole actually comes around to forming and I think the biggest thing that's confused a lot of people is I think the idea that um, an induced dipole is hard to see because often like with an ion uh, a giveaway is you see like a plus or a minus charge or like more than one you see maybe plus two or plus or negative three or whatever and um, so that's really like a big giveaway that you're dealing with an ion is the fact that you see that the species has lost or gained one or more electrons um, and with the permanent dipole we usually get more used to seeing those because we're used to seeing oxygen bonded to hydrogens and all that stuff um, but induced dipoles are a little little bit trickier to spot and I think um, it's a good idea to just go through um, this concept one more time because I know it's been mentioned in class a few times but if we think of I'm going to draw a squiggle and I <laughs> this basically is just a carbon chain so all I'm drawing is this and each carbon is fully saturated with hydrogens so each carbon has four bonds in total and I'm just filling the extra bonds it can make with hydrogens because it's just a fully saturated chain and so when I draw the like zigzag squiggle thing this is really what I'm drawing um, but it's just so much easier to draw the squiggle than to draw all the hydrogens so when we draw this um, squiggle line, the carbon chain, we can really just think of it as a bunch of carbon hydrogen bonds. And like we said up here, remember we said carbon hydrogen bond is a great example of a nonpolar covalent bond because the difference in electronegativities between the two atoms is really not that large. So they're pretty equal in sharing. So what I mean is within this one atom, we can say pretty equal sharing of electrons. Great. Okay. So when we talk about just looking at this carbon chain, I'm going to circle it as if it's like in a blob because really this carbon chain is like three dimensional and you can think of all of the, all the carbons being like spheres and the hydrogens are like smaller spheres and everything is three dimensional. That's really important to remember. Um, and so I'm just going to draw is this bubble. And um, so one of the things that we discussed in class was the idea of how an induced dipole can just sort of become an induced dipole from like by random chance. And really the idea of that is um, you can have sort of electrons like floating around and they're like zipping through space. You know, they're just moving around all the time. It's very dynamic. And maybe at one point in time, you have more electrons on this side of the atom than you do on here. So like you still have a couple on this side, but you have a lot more on one side than you do on the other. And so what this will create is obviously we can see that there's an imbalance in the electron density. And so we would say that this side is delta negative because it has slightly more electron density than this side. And so remember that this is random. So this can be over in a split second, um, and it really doesn't have to last a long time. But let's say that we had another carbon chain hanging around next to it, and all of a sudden now the electron density in this, um, in this carbon chain, so it's just zipping around, it now feels the pull from from this this lack of electron density right it's just like this is you can think of this as just being like like a like a vacuum it's attracting electron density because there's a lack of electron density in this area and so this carbon molecule over here feels that pull and so these electrons start to get pulled towards this lack of electron density space 
And so what's going to happen is you'll get so much more now electrons migrating over to this area and fewer on this side. And overall, what that gives us is just like before, we had the delta negative, delta positive, and now these can interact between each other, which is really great because now we have an ID to ID interaction. So the concept of this really comes from the word induced, meaning that you're really creating a dipole you're, you're inducing it, right? You're, it's not innate in the carbon molecule. The carbon molecule isn't born having that um, dipole like uh, oxygen to hydrogen would, but instead we have something that's being kind of, one, it can be created sort of randomly through just like random electron um, density movement, right? That was this example. Or it can be induced by some other dipole, whether this was whether induced by a random like dipole creation, or you could have induced this, I'm gonna draw a similar example, where let's say I had that same carbon chain, that same carbon chain, and now I'm going to, let's say we have a sodium ion floating around, right? This is gonna act very much just like this initially did. It's going to act like a, it has a lack of electron density, right, because it's lost a full electron. So it's going to act like our vacuum cleaner, and it's going to pull electron density towards it. So that means that for some split second, now I have more electron density over here and less electron density over here. And so overall, what that gives me is a delta negative over here, a delta positive over here. And now these two can interact. And this kind of interaction we call ID to ion. But really the idea is the same. Over here we had random movement of electrons which created our induced dipole and that induced a dipole in the other carbon, um, carbon chain. Whereas here our ion induced the dipole in our carbon chain and then they could be free to attract each other. And you could do this again, the same example if you had a carbon chain and you had an oxygen hydrogen um, so now we know that this is a permanent dipole and the electronegativity of the oxygen is larger than of the hydrogen so more electrons will be towards the oxygen than the hydrogen so we can draw our differences in uh, in charge and electron density and so now we know that uh, here this was acting more of like a vacuum cleaner in terms of attracting electron density now we've got like a leaf blower situation where this is repelling electron density because it's already so much here. And so it's going to be pushing electrons away from it. And so you'll have more electron density up here and maybe a little like fewer down here. So like a lot more up there. Yeah, we get the point. Um, okay, so that's going to be our lack of electron density and we have more dense uh, electron distribution over here and so overall these can interact and we get ID to PD interaction. So really the main idea is that through some way either you first create first you you create this random um, this random electron unequal distribution and this leads to an induced dipole formation which then can induce another dipole forming, and you can think of that as like domino effect. Um, or you could have an ion which induces a dipole through uh, either attracting or repelling electron density, and sort of a similar situation with a permanent dipole also uh, repelling or attracting electron density and creating a dipole in that carbon chain. So that's really the big um, idea behind induced dipoles, because I know it can be a little bit confusing. So hopefully that was helpful and that cleared up some things. Um, yeah, and hopefully you'll hear me in another video.